Hi, everyone, and thank you all for coming. I see so many friends and familiar faces. It's, it's really great to be here. Madeline, welcome. Thank you. The last time I saw you was over Zoom, right? We, um, we did a, a conversation uh, during COVID and for your last book of poetry. And um, so it's nice to have the follow-up here to, to welcome you with. Um, I, I think of, of this book as an autobiography of the inner self in verse. And what I love about your poetry is that it's so accessible and relatable. And especially for women, I think of, of a certain age. And uh, so I can say without reservation that I, I related to so many of your poems. Um, can you describe your process, how a poem unfolds, and what constitutes a, a topic for a poem? Well, that's a great question, but impossible to answer. <laughs> uh, I'd like to know what happens in my head, um, in my imagination, um, that there's no formula for it. Um, Lately, I've been recovering from, I want to say stupid fall, but that's what it was. Um, and I hurt my back. And I thought, mm. oh, I have to stay still for a while, be perfect time to write. Well, it was a blank time to write. So I used to think I had to write at a certain time of day, either in the morning or the late afternoon. But sometimes at night, I get inspiration. So I don't have a fixed time or place. But it just has to be somewhat quiet so I can concentrate. And sometimes I think my poems, I don't know whether to wear my glasses or not, and are too personal, too intimate. But I've discovered from events like this and just encountering people that that's what people like. Uh, they want to know what's in your thoughts and how you're dealing with old age. And surprisingly, old age has been a uh, creative time for me. When I was involved in politics, I didn't have time, literally, uh, and other priorities occupied my mind. And I guess before politics, I was inclined towards poetry, but not. I didn't write very much. Uh, but I read quite a bit of poetry, and I've always enjoyed that. But I wish I had a simple answer for you. Uh, that would be useful, but I think just when when my mind want, it, I'm sometimes in, inspired by what happens in the world around me, uh, either a crisis or something funny, or, uh, and for a long time I didn't know if I was a, a poet, but somebody called me a poet. And I responded, so I guess I am a poet. <laughs> so I, I, I won a, uh, I was a finalist in the poetry contest of New England independent bookstores. So I thought, yeah, I guess it's for real. <laughs> um, and I'm very grateful for that. I mean, you might think politics and poetry don't go together. Uh, they are different lifestyles. Uh, politics, I was much more an outward person, uh, reaching outward for affirmation and behaving in, in a, a way that could be understood and interpreted. And 
poetry is much more intimate, where you dig deep into your own thinking and imagination. But I guess there are two different stages of my life. Now that I'm a poet, I couldn't imagine going back to politics, especially this era's politics. I'm very grateful that I have poetry as an alternative. I'm tempted to mention his name, but I won't. Uh, well, it doesn't need to be in the Okay. Anyway, I'm happy to be here again. This is probably my last poetry reading for a while, and it's a wonderful bookstore and a wonderful venue, and we can brag about it in the county, but we don't have anything like this. Oh. So I congratulate everybody who patronizes the bookstore and the bookstore owners themselves. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Not nice. Not nice. Um, this, you've divided this collection into four different sections. And I was wondering how you, how you chose each section, each, um, what poems to put in each section. I wish I could answer that too, but I, I didn't put them in each section. My, my publisher did. Oh, your publisher? <laughs> oh, that's interesting because I, even though they were numbered, they weren't uh, labeled. So I divided them into four sections. Uh, memories, uh, the seasons, because you write beautifully about nature. And aging, of course, is, is a main one. And then just being alive, what it is that, that you notice, you know? It's... Uh... Well, thank you. Thank you. I mean, I didn't consciously do that, obviously, but I'm glad it fit into some kind of order. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's interesting that, that the publisher felt that they, they had to break it up like that. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Um, as you said earlier that uh, poetry is very personal, and um, do you think that uh, we become more vulnerable as, as uh, we get older and we're able to express ourselves in, in a more personal way? That was true for me, certainly. Um, I just, I just allowed myself to expose my inner feelings. Can you be heard? Well, I'll just start with the poem in, in the title. I mean, Sometimes things only are poetic when you look at them a certain way. And the phrase, walk with me, just suddenly became beautiful and more intimate. Uh, I'll just read it. It's a very simple poem. Walk with me. Get your hat and coat and walk with me. I heard the word sung this afternoon doing a folk music concert. They were seductive. Walk with me through the woods, along the sea, up the mountain. Walk with me, yes. Now with this poem, I didn't know whether to end it with the simple yes, or yes, I'm coming, <laughs> yes, I will. You can change it if you wish <laughs> to suit whatever whatever, but I guess it's, it's, it's a, a way away from loneliness to walk with me and be with someone. Do you want me to read anything else? Yes, pick another. What should I do? 
This this is called laundry. This morning I hung our freshly washed diapers to dry in the sun scarce alleyway in the back of our building in Cambridge, Massachusetts. When I took them down this afternoon, I pressed my nose into the folds that smelled like freshly cut grass. Never mind the gray sidewalks. I laid the diapers in my wicker basket where a small black cinder had fallen from above. I picked up the diaper and shook the cinder off before I neatly laid the diaper down again. I realize this is very dated. (laughs) 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 Who washes or hangs up diapers anymore? But there was such a contrast with the uh, feeling of fresh laundry and the brutality of the cinder um, falling down or, or to Well, Mrs. May's apple cake. Mrs. May was my mother. The one stiff white recipe card had been squeezed into the gray metal box too long. Now it was yellow and soft, like an old linen dish towel, and smelled like dust. All that pulling the card out and forcing it back in had frayed the edges and folded the corners up or up. But the word still spoke, Mrs. May's apple cake. She had called the dog, the doe, Mirbate, a name extracted from Alsace, where they spoke both German and French. The card instructed me in English, cream a quarter pound of butter. Oh, I am getting hoarse. Cream a quarter pound of butter, add sugar, one egg, stir one cup flour and a half a teaspoon baking powder. I forgot. A pinch of salt, too late. I followed her recipe more or less. I scraped out the apple core, sliced the apples nice and thin, and layered them in a circle around the dough. I splashed a half a cup of cream into a small blue and white bowl, whisked the cream together with a tablespoon of sugar and one fat egg. I spilled the mixture over the apples, drowning them in a glossy yellow, and slid them into the oven carefully while my mother seemed to be at my side. I marked some of these. I found myself gravitating back to your beautiful love poems. And I don't know if you feel like you would like to read one or two of them. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. Well, I can understand that. They're, they're absolutely beautiful. And, Which one uh, struck you? Pardon? Which one struck Well, uh, I, Happiness on page 84. Yeah. Oh, is it 85? Secret happiness. Boy, I hope you were reading this part out. <laughs> Let's, see. Let's see where it is. I'll read Secret Happiness. I didn't think it would happen again. That's the one I meant, yeah. I didn't think it would, it would happen again, that I would be drawn into deep friendship with a man I could talk to about James Joyce and Elizabeth Bishop, hold hands with with pleasure. I am young, not like the adolescence I was once. Not quite, but similar, 
astounded by my body and my secret happiness. It's beautiful. Thank you. And answering on page 64. Sorry. And answering. This was my second husband, um, who was, who met all my criteria. <laughs> <laughs> He had to be both a feminist and a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> answering. I cannot erase your voice from the answering machine. I should. It is time. No, not now, not yet. I loved your voice. I love it still. Warm, kind, even to strangers. Now I linger over your lasting words. I hover over your photograph, about to speak, about to smile, as you hold the glass, about to meet your lips. You listen to someone I cannot see, I cannot hear from my side. Your V-neck sweater, light blue, white collar, not a tie, those white spiky eyebrows I would not let you trim. I turn the lamp toward you to catch your slender pose. Closer, closer, until my eyes almost touch your eyes. That's beautiful. Beautiful. As we age, how do you think our viewpoint on life changes it, it does change i think we we think more we ruminate more in our imagination we think more about aging uh when and how will the end come um but this is a different kind of poem it's called the eye doctor I sat in the ophthalmologist's waiting room for two and a half hours with my New Yorker magazine that I could not read because my eyes were dilated. <laughs> I could not see, but I could think about all this waste of time spent sitting in a chair looking at other patients, wondering who would be next. Who would it be? When would it be my turn? Don't they understand? I don't have time to waste. I am old. I focus on what patients were wearing their sneakers and socks, their hair, their hands, their eyes. Meanwhile, I rehearse how I would complain to the doctor or to anyone about how badly they managed the system. It was for the convenience of the doctor, not the patient. I would explain we were helpless, shifting for hours in our chairs, oh, staring at every nurse who walked by, <laughs> hoping we would be next. The door opened. The smiling doctor walked in. Hi, Madeline, he exclaimed. How is your son, Adam? <laughs> Fine, I said, and smiled back. I forgot every word I was going to say. <laughs> you, you have a very special relationship to your cat. Yes. And you've written a, a couple of wonderful poems about that relationship. Here's a short one on page 57. Is that what you were referring uh, to? What do I have? 
Uh, um, the the longer one is in the blue book. Oh, you know, read read the one that you have there. My cat loves me. She tells me so before I fall asleep. She climbs up to my bed and settles herself at my elbow. Beneath the book I hold up high. She purrs like a cello, her eyes in a heavy slant, trusting me to stay still. And something stirs her until something stirs her and she picks herself up and silently leaves. As, as we all know, you've been a strong advocate for women. And I wonder how has your experience of being the first woman in many cases affected how you've responded to challenges? Well, that's worthy of a book. That's worthy of a book. Well, you, 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 but, uh, right. I just responded instinctively. I didn't become a new person, but I was fortunate in having good people around me. And the most important thing I did was to appoint people to various positions, um, two of whom are here right now. But they made me who who I could be, and we were all pioneers in a way, uh, doing things for the first time. And um, it was exciting. It was exciting and somewhat awesome because I know, I knew then that if we succeeded or failed, we would be setting a marker for the next person who came along. So we had to we had to succeed, um, and we made some mistakes, but we also we also were adventurous mm. and creative, and I think that stood us in good stead. And now, you know, the the longer the time between when you were elected and right now the present. The longer the time, the better you look. <laughs> so I get lots of compliments wherever I go. <laughs> um, in, in a recent interview, uh, you mentioned you had three wishes. One, that your family and friends be accessible and well. Two, that you continue to have a sense of adventure. And three, that you wish Donald Trump would go away. <laughs> <laughs> I would put those in reverse order. Oh. <laughs> I love that quote, though. Thank yeah. you. How, how do you balance in your own life what is going on around us? In the world, and and still stay resilient and hopeful. Well, that's a challenge we all face. We all face right now. Um, and I live at Wake Robin, which is a continuing care community, and we have had two speakers talking about hope in in this time. And I think we just have to. Stop watching TV for <laughs> at least 20 minutes and focus on our future. And it, it's, I mean, if you take everything seriously, it is depressing. And you don't need a, a therapist to tell you that. Uh, you can actually figure it out yourself. So I think by spending time with family, with good friends, with good books, with, with good music, and realizing there is comfort outside of politics. But at the same time, we can't ignore politics because there's so much at stake. So you can't just crawl in a hole and pull the cover over it. 
uh, we still have to be engaged. And it's a tough thing to do. I think the only comfort, comfort I get is when I talk with other people who feel the same way. Mm -hmm. And you realize you're not by yourself, you're not unique. But we still have the power of the vote and hopefully that will count for something. Absolutely. Uh, Is there another poem you'd like to, to read? Yes, if I can find it. This is called Lost and Found. Hmm. Pardon me. <laughs> Lost and Found. I looked under the bed first for my hearing aid. It might have fallen off when I put my earrings on. Too dark to see much under the bed except for crumpled Kleenex. The silver piece that fit behind my ear would have glinted. It would have announced itself. I looked further in unlikely places, just in case. Behind the toilet bowl, in the wastebasket, covered by piles of papers, under the pillows in the living room. <laughs> Next to my computer amidst pens that no longer wrote, or the bedspread perhaps in case it dropped when I'd been making the bed. Under the dining room table, dropped while eating dinner, I moved the chairs and looked more than once, and once again and again. Losing the hearing aid was worse than losing an earring like I had done the day before. The hearing aid was part of my body. I was lopsided with just one in my left ear. I was almost deaf, oblivious to what was happening around me. I had to find it. I talked myself into believing I could replace just one hearing aid and it would not cost thousands of dollars like I feared the two earrings would. After my third round of searching, both the house and my car, I called the Loose Hearing Center to find out how long it would take to get one new hearing aid. And God forbid, what would it cost? Stephanie was not in. Leave a message, I was told. I did, trying not to sound foolish having gotten that close to spending a fortune to buy a new one, I retraced my steps once more. I stopped for the fourth time at the small hallway table where I kept face masks and winter hats. I picked everything up with my two fingers one by one and shook it. A tiny silver triangle hung from a string on the mask. Oh, I sang. Laughter bounced inside me. For the first time, I had found the secret source of happiness. <laughs> <laughs> lose, lose something precious like a diamond ring or a hearing aid. Look for it long enough to waste half or a whole day. Suffer self flagellation when all hope is gone, you find it. Oh, that's, that's great. 